read to you from the word of the Lord tonight, if you will kindly listen. And it's amazing to me, and I should not be amazed, but it is always beautiful how the order of a service is so symptomatic of the direction of the Holy Ghost. Brother Harvey McNair stood up here to lead song service tonight, and he opened with the beautiful song, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound That Saved a Wretch Like Me. And then he sang, Grace, Grace, God's Grace. And my subject tonight is the marvelous grace of God. And I want to read to you from Romans, the fifth chapter. I'm beginning at the 14th verse. And there's such meaning phraseology here. If you'd be kind enough, I'd like for you to listen carefully. And I think it's always good for us to stand when we read the word of a king. Would you stand, please? We're reading the word of the king. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, notice, much more they which received abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Isn't he great? Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Beautiful, beautiful reading of the scriptures. Sister Jean sang that last verse, or the last phrase, the last portion of that song. So won't you strengthen me? Yes, Lord. Encourage me. Again. So won't you strengthen, strengthen me, Lord? Encourage, encourage me. Deliver me, deliver me, Lord. I pray. And pray. For I know oh, yes. thy weakness, but I know thy strength. And that is why I sing. Hallelujah. with me for the message will you dear Jesus we stand in your presence tonight oh how we need thy touch how we need thy great presence to overshadow us to help us to touch us to fall upon us we're looking to you Lord believing that you're able to hear and answer our prayers 
And we thank you, O oh God, that in thy great name we can find the strength and the power of righteousness that's found in your presence. In this great audience tonight, you know who stands here. You know who needs the precious presence of the Holy Ghost. You know who needs the touch of that great, glorious grace. We all need to be canopied by the Holy Ghost. We need your power around us. And we're believing you're going to hear and answer our prayer. And give us great anointing to preach the precious word. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be seated. The great manner in which God's unmerited favor has been shed upon many is amazing to us all. The subject of the grace of God is a Bible subject. And it brings with it an understanding and an insight into God's great heart. And yet when we consider the majesty of the subject that we're talking about, we're almost pressed to say like the psalmist David, what is man that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man that thou visitest him. David is like many who through the ages have asked the question. What is God's interest in man? What is the great and the profound work that has been done in behalf of man by almighty God? David himself made the statement. He said, when I consider the work of thy hands, the sun, the moon, and the stars... When he looked at the beauty of God's great, great creation, the grandeur of creation, and the remarkable hand of God in evidence in creation, he found it difficult to see God's infinite interest in the human being. I watched with great deal of interest your newspapers in the last few days that are telling us the story of the great attempt to find life on Mars. And of course, this has a lot of the world standing by watching with great amazement. Whatever may be the case, while men explore the wonders of the universe that God has made, within the very atmosphere of the world in which we live, there is the marvels of God's plan that sometimes we overlook. And I sometimes wonder, I wonder if we would spend as much money on investigating the spiritual prospect of God's presence and what it could do for man if we wouldn't be a whole lot further ahead in the great matter of human blessing than to be seeking out in outer space for the prospect of life on Mars. And yet this is man. Man in his quest for conquest. And yet, in spite of it, right before us and right around us tonight is a marvelous presence of the Holy Ghost. It's all around us. In fact, the Apostle Paul did what David did, but he said it in another way. He was talking about this great love of God. And he said, for I am persuaded that neither death and nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And he was talking with us of the greatness of the majesty of God. I know that many of you are acquainted with Brother C.B. Dudley, and to those of us who are acquainted with him down in the area of the states, we have a great appreciation for what Brother Dudley represents. But I think we look at a man like Brother Dudley 
and really recognize what God can do for an individual. How God can reach for a man. No matter how deep he is. I've heard Brother Dudley many times speak about the drunkenness and the debauchery of his life. And one of the most beautiful things is to see God take a life and put his hand on it. Then begin to frame it and use it and bless it and make it a vessel for his glory. And this is what this great message is all about. But in our understanding of the grace of God, and I say this very carefully, I have no, I have no uh, a special kind of axe to grind. I have no bones to pick. I'm interested in this message because I think there's something great in it that sometimes we do not fully understand. I hear some people talking on the legalistic approach to religion and I think sometimes we can get way over on the side of legalism. Then I hear people talk about the grace of God in a strange manner that tells you that there is a, such a thing as a grace that no matter what you do, you don't have to do anything about repentance. God's grace covers it all. I can't find that in my Bible. It's hard for me to find. And I have looked and sought for that to see whether the scripture does talk about that. But I find something about the grace of God that I trust and pray I can give to you tonight in an infusion of the truth that comes from this book. You know, it's an amazing thing, but I sometimes think we're not aware of what the Lord really did at Calvary. We don't know the greatness of what he did. I'm going to go to an Old Testament chapter and I'm not going to read it all. It's Deuteronomy 23. I'm not going to read it all because if you would read Deuteronomy 23, you would know that to read it in a mixed congregation would be a little bit embarrassing. And yet, I don't think that the scripture is an embarrassing thing, but I think there is a discretion that can be used when we use the word of the Lord. And in Deuteronomy 23, there is several very vital things I want to bring to your attention that show to us what God really did for us at Calvary. Maybe you didn't know this, but in the law, it was taught that an illegitimate child could not enter into the presence of the Lord for 10 generations. And I want you to do a little thinking about that. You'll find this in the second chapter, or rather the second verse of the 23rd chapter of Deuteronomy. That means that a child brought into this world who didn't request to be brought into this world. Every child that's born is not here by choice. The child that is born is the result of the cohabitation of a man and a woman. And in this instance, the child that is illegitimate is not, cannot come into the presence of God according to the law. Now the law is strong. Don't underestimate the strength of the law. It was strong. And then to understand this, that for 10 generations succeeding that child, nobody born of that child could come into the presence of the Lord is astounding. But that's what the law said. And I want you to note that the law makes that very clear. It goes on to say some other things. I want you to notice that it classes the Ammonites and the Moabites in the same situation. And that's almost a strange thing. For you wonder why the Ammonites and the Moabites are placed in the same category of the illegitimates. But it tells us this. The Ammonites and the Moabites, they could not come into the presence of the Lord for 10 generations. And the reason that was given for it is simply this. When they saw the children of Israel coming up out of Egypt and they came into their land. The scripture tells us in Deuteronomy 23 that they were not willing to give them bread and water. 
And the Lord held that as a judgment against the Ammonites and Moabites because they would not be kind to God's people. Let me stop for a moment tonight and tell you this. God takes care of his people. Let me also urge upon you something else that might be some food for thought in your consideration of the scriptures. And that is this. Not only does he care for his people, but he also is very deeply concerned about his servants. And the Bible says, touch not mine anointed, do my prophets no harm. I think that one of the things that the man of God only has that is working in his behalf is the protectorate of the hand of God. He cannot rely many times on others. So he has to completely rely on God and his protection. So many things can be done to harm the servant of the Lord. And so the Lord takes special care over those who are called his servants. And in this instance, he tells us because the Ammonites and the Moabites did not give bread and water to the children of Israel, they could not enter the presence of God for ten generations. Now note, if you will, from the scriptures, that another reason for that was they hired a man by the name of Balaam to curse the children of Israel. And God did not like the cursing that Balaam gave to Israel or the fact that Balaam gave the secret of Israel's strength to the King Balak so that they could undermine and tear down the nation of Israel. God said these people can't come into my presence for ten generations. Ten generations will have to pass before they come into my presence. And then it goes on to tell about the Edomites and the Egyptians. The Edomites are the descendants of Esau. The Egyptians, of course, you know, were the people that were masters over Israel and made them bond slaves. And it tells us they couldn't come into the presence of God for three generations. So that God's law outlawed certain people for things they did to God's people from ever coming into his presence. Now you of course realize that the descendants of Esau were very opposed to the promised seed. And if you look today at the condition in Jerusalem, you'll note that that spirit still lingers in that land. And the same descendants have feelings against the promised seed today. It's a strange thing, but it's a true thing. And yet, here we have this remarkable and stringent picture of the power of the law. Many, many people don't know how strong the law is. In fact, I would say to you tonight, as you sit listening to the word of God, that there are many people sitting under the sound of my voice that have not believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, have not accepted his redemptive work of Calvary, have not believed in his power to save. You sit here tonight and think that you are not under any kind of obligation in any way. Let me tell you, if you have not accepted his beautiful name, if you have not received his wonderful cleansing blood, if you have not got that precious remission of sins that comes through his redemptive work, you're under the law. And that law stands as a judgment against your life. Hear me what I'm saying. The law of God stands in this world, but the law of God only is canceled out by the work of Jesus Christ. Now I want you to note, in connection with this, this chapter goes on to explain some other very remarkable things. It tells us about unclean people. It talks about harlots cannot come into the presence of God. The unclean. I'm going to Leviticus 21. And I want to read you something else, if you will, from the scriptures. Because it is a very, very descriptive portion. 
In the Old Testament priesthood, you had to be a perfect human being to be a priest. There was no way you could be a priest unless your very fleshly body was completely unblemished. Now I want to read it to you. Speak unto Aaron. This is Leviticus 21 beginning at the 17th verse. Speak unto Aaron saying, Whosoever he be of thy seed in their generations that hath any blemish, let him not approach to offer the bread of his God. For whatsoever man he be that hath a blemish, he shall not approach a blind man or a lame or he that hath a flat nose or anything superfluous or a man that is broken footed or broken handed or crook backed or a dwarf or he that hath a blemish in his eye or be scurvy or scabbed. No man that hath a blemish of the seed of Aaron the priest shall come nigh to offer the offerings of the Lord made by fire. He hath a blemish. He shall not come nigh to offer the bread of his God. He shall eat the bread of his God, both of the most holy and of the holy. Only he shall not go in to the veil, nor come nigh unto the altar, because he hath a blemish, that he profane not my sanctuaries, for I the Lord do sanctify thee. Now, if you look at this scripture very carefully, it will tell you that any kind of blemish or affliction would absolutely keep you out of the priesthood. Now, I want you to know tonight, if you look around a little bit, and if I looked around at the priesthood on the platform, not many of us would qualify. And you know what I'm talking about. Because there's a lot of blemishes in the most of us. But the point that is there is simply very strong. The law was strong. So strong that when we look at it, it makes us wonder, how can anyone approach God? Or we're, most of us are acquainted with the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are one phase of the law of God. There are many things that are written in this book that are so strong that to recognize them is to recognize how God felt about sin. God was against unrighteousness. He's against sin. There's no, there's no underestimating his opposition to unrighteousness. Our God is a holy God. Our God is a righteous God. The attributes of God are of such strength that there is no man that can come into his presence with anything that is unclean or defiling. And this is where the beauty of the grace of God begins to make its beautiful work known amongst men. I tell you something and I want to make it very plain and I want Brother Smith to get right close to a microphone at this time. I want to make it very plain to you tonight that there is nobody in this audience that can bring your moral righteousness to God and get by with your moral righteousness. There's nobody in this audience that's so good that you can come and say, look God, I'm qualified to come into your presence. The Bible tells us very definitely that uh, the flesh of man is as filthy rags in the sight of the Lord. There is no human righteousness that can stand in his presence. That's plain. That's strong. That's biblical. That's scriptural. You can't lift yourself up by your own bootstraps. You can't plan your own salvation with your own moral acts. There's no way that man can be saved outside of Jesus Christ. No way. No way. 
It is absolutely impossible for you to be able to say, I can live a good life and God will accept me at the end of the race. Let me tell you, friend, in this Adamic nature, there is a powerful unrighteousness. There is covetousness. There is lust. There is evil. There is bent to sin. There is intent to sin. There is dishonesty, unruliness, rebellion, ungodliness godliness, unrighteousness, and there's nothing in this flesh of ours that's any good. We've got to have a Savior. Yes. Oh, praise God. Yes, I've got to make that plain to you tonight. I've got to make you see that you can't get along without this Lord of mine. I've got to make you understand whoever you are sitting under the sound of my voice, whether you be prelate or whether you be a sinner, whether you be a saint or an ungodly individual, there's no way, there's no way you can ever find salvation outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. No way you can find it. We are lost and undone. We are without hope. We are aliens to the commonwealth of Israel. We're far off. We're not even close. We're far from the Lord. Without his salvation. Now I want you to read from Ephesians 2, 13. And I want you to notice this beautiful description of the apostle. Read for us, Brother Smith, please. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off. Now I want you to get that word, ye that were afar off. That's the Gentile world he's talking about. Whenever you see those words afar off, in Acts 2.39, promises unto you, to your children, and to all that are afar off. You know what's interesting to me about that? When Simon Peter was going or was sent to Cornelius' house, he had to have that sheet let down. And the Lord had to tell him three times, slay and eat. And Simon Peter was the man who said in Acts 2.39 to them that are far off. When he said it, he didn't even believe what he was saying. Right, right, That's right. right. Somebody said, you mean Simon Peter didn't believe what he was preaching? Simon Peter was moved on by the Holy Ghost to give a prophetic picture of the plan of God that was to be put into action under the New Testament dispensation. And when he said to them that are afar off, God was moved moving on him by the Holy Ghost to include the Gentile world. And right here it tells us that he did what with those that were afar off? Listen. You are made nigh. You are made nigh by what? Blood of Christ. By the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ brought us nigh to God. Yes. Oh, the wonderful grace of God. Now read on. For he is our peace. He is our peace. Who hath made both one. He hath made both one. And hath broken down the middle wall he of partition. He broke the middle wall of partition. What did he do? Broke yeah. it down. Yes. Broken down the middle wall of partition. Yes. Uh, that was between us. I want you to note what that middle wall of partition was. It was the barrier between Jew and Gentile. And when Jesus gave himself for the sins of mankind, he broke that wall down. Oh, I want you to hear something tonight. You know, there's a lot of things that are a part of our feelings. I don't know. I'm going to make my confession. You can make yours later. But I'll make mine now. When I was a young man, I had a lot of hate in my heart. I don't know why I wasn't brought up to hate. I wasn't brought up to despise. I wasn't brought up to be disrespectful. I was brought up to fear the Lord. But there was something in my nature that as I began to grow older, I got hate in my heart. I was very reactionary against people. And I, I, I disliked what I was feeling inside of me. It was something that when somebody said, let's fight, I'd fight at the drop of a hat. If anyone wanted to battle, I'd battle at any, any given moment. And even when they didn't want to battle, I'd make a fight. Just get in a fight to get in one. Just this kind of a feeling that was in me. And I don't know who you are or where 
where you are but there's a lot of hate in our world there's a lot of spiritual animosity that exists in our world there's a lot of racial feelings and cultural feelings and nationalistic feelings we can't deny it we're part of a nation we have feelings about other nations in fact the whole political mess in our world tonight are the nationalistic feelings that are part of the world in which we live people hating one another but when Jesus Christ comes into your life when Jesus Christ comes into your life when he comes into your life he takes that wall down oh hallelujah hallelujah I want to preach that come on No man that claims to be a child of God has a right to nurse a grudge. No man that claims to be a child of God has a right to have a chip on his shoulder. No man that is a child of God has a right to feel law against everybody. When he came into our life, he took that law down. He said there's neither Jew nor Greek, bond or free, male or female in Christ Jesus. He was letting us know that when we look at a soul, we don't look at a soul as an individual to despise. We look at people as individuals to love. Because he has put his love in our heart. He is our peace. Read, Brother Smith. This gets better as it goes on. Read. Having abolished in his flesh. He abolished in his flesh what? The enmity. The enmity. He abolished it. Oh, listen to me. That beautiful body that was pure as sinless, that was laid on a sacrificial altar, that was pierced on a rugged cross, that was given for the sins of all mankind from the time of his birth to the time he went to the cross. He was the stainless Lamb of God. Yes. Pilate examined him carefully. If he could have found the post, one thing in him that was wrong, he pointed it out. He sought to find it. He couldn't find it. I find no fault in this man. And he took that beautiful, sinless body and put it on the cross. And in his flesh, he destroyed. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. hallelujah. I hear some people say, I hate so and so. I tell you what, when I hear it, it makes my blood crazy. Uh, and there is this kind of feeling in us. Every once in a while, somebody does us a little harm and we want to react against them. Come on, go up, man. Contained in ordinances. Or to make it himself a twain. He made himself a twain. One new man. He took two men and made them one. So making peace. He made peace. And that he might reconcile both he unto might God. Reconcile both unto God. And one body by the cross. One body by the cross. Having slain the enmity thereby. He slew the enmity thereby. And came. And came. And preached peace, and preached to, you, peace to you. Which were far off. Which were afar off. And to them that were not. And to them that were not. For through him we through both have access. We both have what? Access. 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 So what? Access. I lost my place. By one spirit. By one spirit. Under the blood. Under the fire. Yes. Yeah. We've got a privilege of walking right into the presence yes. of God because of Him. Let me tell you something. That old veil stood there. And that veil stood between a man's finding mercy and peace from God. And he had to stand there and wait on one foot and then another. 
another. I wish that priest could get in there and make atonement for my sins. And he'd wait, and then they'd have to wait and hear the pomegranates of those bells moving on that priest's garment before there would be any atonement for sin. And there they wait. They'd come and put their sacrifice there, stand outside the tabernacle, and wait. You can hear him talking. I wish that priest would get with it. I wish you'd get in there and get that sacrifice over. I'm waiting now. I'm waiting now. But oh, I'll tell you what happened. When Jesus came. Yes, sir. When Jesus came. Yes. When this beautiful grace of God yes. was demonstrated to man. He opened up the way. Oh, yeah. He opened up the road. Oh, yeah. He opened up the plan. Oh, yeah. He opened up his purpose. Amen. He said, I'm the Because of my giving my life in your behalf. I want you to go to Colossians 2 14 and this one gets me all stirred up. It thrills my soul. Really, it thrills my soul. The message of the New Testament is the most thrilling thing I've ever heard in my life. I want you to read the 14th verse, Brother Smith, if you will, please. Read. Blotting out the handwriting of oh, Jesus. Man, I like this. I like this. Blotting out the handwriting. Hallelujah. The Lord Yes. There goes Deuteronomy 23. Oh, there it goes. He took at the cross and just tied the pieces.
the Lord makes us stay to us. Yes, sir. Is that the end of that verse? Yes, sir. That was against us, which was contrary to us. That was against us. us, that was contrary to us. Yes. You see, when it said it was contrary against us, it meant actually that that stood. And there was no way we could get around it. Yes, sir. But he became. Oh, bless his pain. You know, these folks that stand behind the pulpits, excuse me for this, I'm a little stirred up at this point. These folks that stand behind their pulpits and make such a little Jesus out of him. They thought he was some kind of little prophet. They thought he was some kind of little story Jesus. Somebody that uh, is nice. He was nice. And he came on the scene. He was a nice fellow. He was a prophet. Oh, yes. When you think about Jesus, when we say a song, when you think about Jesus, he's all right. Yes. That's what he said. Yes. Yeah. Hallelujah. Now say, oh, um, yeah, well, yes. Yeah, have you heard about this? Oh, yes. You mean historical Christ? He's not a historical Christ. He's a God of today. Yes. He's a God of today. But I like that next verse. I want you to get to that next verse. I can't wait. Get to that next verse. And having spoiled principalities and powers. Having spoiled principalities and powers. He made a show of them openly. What did he do? He made a show of them openly. Say it like you mean it. He made a show of them openly. That's right. Triumphant. Yes, sir. Oh, yes. The beauty, the beauty 
of this glorious salvation. Yes. Oh, he made a show of it openly, triumphing over them That's in it. Yes, he let the whole world know. Let me, let me go. To, I didn't give you this, but you stand there a while for the Smith Yard next ball. Stay right there. I want you to know, in the 8th chapter of John, there is the real face of the law against the grace of God. There is this woman cast into the midst of her accusers who say she was caught in the very act of adultery. The scriptures of Moses and the law says, stone her. What sayest thou? You know, it's always a strange thing. It's always amazing to me that they didn't bring the old boy. Because he belonged there with them. They were just bringing her and standing in accusation against her. And as they stood in accusation against her, little did they know that the one that they were talking to was the one who made that law. Yes, sir. Little did they realize when he stooped on that ground and rolled with his finger. I'm going to tell you something about him with that finger. He rolled with that finger another time. Yes, but he rolled in tablets of stone. Yes, and it says that the tablets of stone were written by the finger of God. Yes, but the cooling this time, he rolled in sand. You know why he rolled in sand? Because the winds of time would blow away. When he came, he didn't come to condemn the world. He came to save the world. Read John 3, 17. Oh, I didn't know you were right, well, that's all right. You get it, man, get it. <laughs> oh, we got to get with it right here. Oh, I want you to know, when he wrote you that statement, he didn't write so that men could come along ages later and say, ah! I'll find what he wrote in that saying. It's blown away by this time. He didn't come to write down our sins. He came to take our sins. <laughs>
to me. I'll tell you something, this grace message is not something for us that just leave it up. It's not to be there. It's a great force. It's not coming. Oh, I got the Holy Ghost in my life. I can tell you. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. God's divine ability. Say it again. God's divine ability. You didn't say it loud enough. Get over here and say it. <laughs> say it. You know what grace done for me? Call me to shake my fist at the old liquor store and say, get your feet back to me. God's divine ability. Oh, yes, sir. Go to Psalms 51. I'm hardly through with John 8 yet. Let me talk a little bit about John 8. The first time he came, as long as I'm saying, the Bible says he didn't say a word. He didn't say a word. He got up. And then he said, Let me hear this without saying, first he cast a stone at him. And then he got down and wrote the second time. And when he got up, there was nobody there to accuse him. That no man accused me. And she said, No man, Lord. I'll tell you what he said. Go! Hey! Shit! Yes, sir! No! No! Right. Now that's grace. That's grace. That's grace. That's grace. Go! Hey! Shit! No! No! Go to Titus. We'll get the sound to you now. Go to Titus. Praise God. Get to Titus. Amen. Oh! Yes, sir. And teach us yes, sir. how to live. Right. 
Right. How many people go to the 51st Psalm? How much you get this, Brother Smith? This thing thrilled my soul. I've never seen it in this light until the other day when I was looking at it. And I like to jump out of my shoes when I read it. You've heard, you've heard David's cry. Have you heard that cry? I want you to do this when I pray. I saw something there the other day that amazed me. And I didn't realize it. I've read the 51st Psalm for years and years. But I was asking God to help me to understand this great grace and power. And I read that psalm. Oh, I began to understand something I've never seen before. Would you read verse what, 1, 2, and 3? Read yes. that for me, please. Listen to this. Have mercy upon me, O God, 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 according to thy, to thy loving kindness. According to thy loving kindness. Now that's grace. Uh -huh. Read. According unto the multitude of thy tender mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Blot out my transgressions. Where would David get a blotting out of transgressions in the law? Tell me. When? It suddenly dawned on me. He was prophesying. Yes, he was. David was a prophet. The scripture says he was a prophet. The second chapter of Acts says he was a prophet. David was a sinner, an adulterer, a murderer. He should have died for his sins. Yes, sir. But he prayed prophetically, and he actually drew from Calvary in an Old Testament dispensation the strength of God. By virtue of his grace. I mean, this is crazy. Amen. Those that are in their throes of iniquity, David didn't have a Savior as such. He knew Jehovah God and his compound names, but he didn't know the Redeemer's Savior. And he said, Blood my transgressions. Where in the Old Testament could he have them run it out? But by a sacrifice offering. But they would have killed him before the sacrifice was made. No sacrifice for his No sacrifice for his Now read. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. He couldn't go to the labor, he wasn't a priest. He had to clean out the precious tender mercies of the prophesied redeemer. What else did he say? And cleanse me from my sins. Cleanse me from my sins. For I acknowledge. I acknowledge my transgression. And my sin my is ever before me. My sin is ever before me. All right. We drop down to the ninth verse. Read. I have thy face from my sins. I have thy face from my sins. And blot out all my iniquities. all my iniquities. Where? Created me a clean heart. Oh, listen to this. I 
stand here and fight a little old finite man so wicked in Adamic flesh, so blessed by a precious man, so touched by a pure blood, so made new by a beautiful spirit, so changed by a life that went to the cross that you and I have lived. Oh, we talk about the beautiful grace of God. We look at it and we think about it and we don't even realize what he has done for us. But hear me tonight. And this is the thing that just absolutely brings home to me the beauty of what I'm saying. When he came, he just made it all different. My life from this point on is not the life of Nathaniel A. Urshan. I like how Paul said it. He said, ye are not your own. Ye are not your own. You're bought with what? A price. You were bought with a price. You don't even belong to yourself. Man, you got your own name. You got that same old name. Nathaniel Harrison is still my name. But I've been bought not by silver or gold, but by the precious blood of Jesus Christ of the beautiful, holy, sinless Lamb of God that brought me from the depths of sin. There's a lot of people concerned about His coming and they'll say, I'm not ready for His coming. I, I don't feel in my heart there is a feeling in us of our own inadequacy. That's good. We shouldn't be, a, we shouldn't have an inferiority, but we should have a feeling of inadequacy. And when we feel that inadequacy, we should be like Paul, who said, when I am weak, then I am strong. He said, I asked the Lord, remove this thorn in the flesh. And I asked him three times, and I got an answer from him. My grace is sufficient for me. sufficient for thee. And then I discovered when I am weak, then I am strong. I have quit glowing in revelations. I have quit bragging about what I once was and what I am now. I have learned that in troubles and in tribulations, I cry out to him and he gives me that grace that's sufficient for me. For any problem, for any for any Let's praise him again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When he went to the cross, I want you to hear it. When he went to the cross, a man went free that day. Oh, God. His name was Barabbas. They walked up to that cell door and said, All right, Lord, you're free. Free? I'm free? You're free? You're free? Why am I free? Somebody is going to the cross in your place. Oh, Jesus. Who's going to the cross in my place? Oh, God. Jesus of Nazareth oh, is going to take your place. Free? Can't believe it. I'm free. That's what Paul said. As by one man sin, judgment entered into the world by one man's righteousness, the free forgiveness of the truth. And the door was open that you and I could enjoy. Here you are, Tim, sitting under the beauty of the presence of God. And sitting under the beauty of the presence of God. There's a spiritual atmosphere in this tabernacle. It's filled with the glory of God. It's filled with the power of God. It's filled with the remission of forgiveness and grace. There's a name that's just waiting to be pronounced on you in baptism that can take all the sins that are left away from you. There's a repentance.
Egito também. There's a sanctification of the people in the presence of God. I did it all for you. I went to the I went to the cross. I went to the grave. I went to hell.
sit there and let this beautiful grace go wasted. Come on, entire God. Come on, young lady out there tonight. Come on, for the loathsome way of sin, and hide you in the blood of Jesus. Come on. If you sunk deep into the reality, I follow the lift you out of it. There's hope in this world because there's a Jesus. And he wants you to come. He wants you to come right now. There's a prayer room back here. Then for the big way for you to come and pray. I want you to come out of this audience calling out the name of the Lord. Father, 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 